Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 6. My name is Lauren, and I'll be with you today along with my colleague behind the scenes, Heather, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, our host, Kate, will be talking with our presenter, Nancy Ackles, about co communicative grammar instruction principles and how to apply them in several practical grammar activities that can be adapted for all levels. So let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome. As Lauren said, my name is Kate and I'm very happy to be with you here today once again as your host and facilitator. We'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our first time viewers and are also very happy as we always are to see our repeat viewers and our repeat participants. It's great to have you here with us today. Let's begin with these great photos sent to us by Keshua Kiwia, featuring teachers at the American Corner in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. They were participating in session 6.2, which focused on technology-supported task engagement. So thank you, Kesha, for sending in these photos. We love to see teachers learning together and using strategies presenting during our sessions. So please share your photos by emailing them to American English Webinars at FHI360.org or by sharing them on social media. If you share via social media, be sure to tag us at American English for Educators and we may feature one of your photos during the next webinar. Today is our fourth session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 6. Our remaining webinars are related to communicative grammar teaching and foundations of TESOL methodology. Which sessions are you most excited about? Share your responses in the chat. And we hope you will be able to use all of the ideas we share throughout the series. So as a reminder, here's what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and is often related to an American English e-teacher massive open online course or to a teacher's corner theme on the American English website. The presenter will present the material and I as your host will make questions, uh, will, make, uh, will ask questions and make comments too. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. So please do share your thoughts using the comments feature or chat box. When our session comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of the post. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. You must answer two out of three questions correctly and once you've successfully passed the quiz, you can expect to get your badge via email within about a week. And as a reminder, the free self-paced massive open online course Teaching English to Young Learners is open until December 2nd, 2019. This MOOC introduces participants to the theory and practice of teaching English as a foreign language to three to 10 year olds. Through engaging videos and practical readings, educators will explore English language teaching approaches that are not only effective, but also fun and engaging for children. If you complete all required activities with a score of 70% or higher, you'll receive a digital badge and certificate. So please learn more and register at the link listed here. And now for today's session, Developing Grammar Proficiency Through Communicative Activities. In this webinar, we'll explore key principles associated with communicative grammar instruction, learn how to apply these principles in the classroom, and consider how to create and evaluate grammar activities that will enhance your students' ability to use English for real communication. We will also examine several practical grammar activities that can be used with learners of different ages and skill levels. And these activities require minimal equipment, supplies, or space, so we hope that they're applicable to everyone in your context. And now we're happy to introduce our presenter, Nancy Ackles. In her long career, Nancy has had opportunities to work together with and learn from many teachers first in the United States and then in Africa, Asia, and Europe. 
She holds a PhD in linguistics and is the author of The Grammar Guide, Developing Language Skills for Academic Success. Nancy also developed one of my favorite resources on our website, American Teens Talk, which is a free audio and text resource available on our website. She especially admires and enjoys collaborating with language teachers who work in schools with limited resources. So welcome, Nancy. We're so happy to have you here with us today. Thank you. And hello and welcome to all of you. I'm glad you're here. And the very first thing I want to say is that I know it is very difficult to make time in a busy teacher's life to attend a webinar. And the fact that you're here is a sign that you are committed professionals. And I thank you for taking this time for professional development. Now, our next slide is a question. Who are the true experts on teaching in your context? You are. And while I certainly hope that the things I present today will be useful to you in your teaching contexts, I know that you are the true experts on your students and their needs. You know your students, you know your schools and organization, you know your community's expectations. I believe that you'll be able to apply the principles we talk about today, but you should adapt these activities in the ways that best suit your students and their needs because you are the true experts on your situation. And here's another question. Who are the Olympic champions in our field? Now, some of you teach in wonderful classrooms with plenty of modern technology and a photocopier available whenever you need it. Some of you probably teach in classrooms that have only a chalkboard, and that chalkboard may be so old and rough that your chalk won't write in the middle of the board. You have to write along the outer edges of the board only. Many teachers must use textbooks that are small and inexpensive and do not provide all the practice that their students need. I've also worked with teachers who must teach without textbooks or with only one textbook for every 10 students. So who are the Olympic champions in our field? If you work in a low resource classroom, you are. If you work in a very low resource classroom, you are my hero. You are the superheroes of our profession, our Olympic champions. And I think that all of us listening and participating today salute you. Now, today we're going to practice some principles of communicative language teaching. And then we're going to have some activities that allow you to do these things in the classroom. All of these activities are things you can do without needing anything more than paper and pencils. So they're usable in all kinds of classrooms, well-equipped ones and ones that aren't so well-equipped. And this is our plan for the session. We'll talk just a little bit about the history of grammar teaching. Then we'll look at three principles for communicative grammar teaching. Then we'll look at some specific activities you can use with your students. So a very quick history of grammar teaching. Why do we talk so much in our field about communicative language teaching? In the past, there were sometimes English classes where everyone learned lots of grammar rules, but students did not become fluent users of English. They knew all the rules, could answer questions on grammar tests, but they couldn't hold conversations and really talk to people in English. Sometimes classes focused on learning to translate sentences from the learner's first language into English or from English into the student's first language. The problem with this approach is that today we usually aren't trying to train translators. We are trying to train students so they won't need translators. These problems led, as many of you know, to communicative language teaching. So let's ask first, what, in your opinion, are some characteristics of communicative language teaching? All right, great, great question, Nancy. Let's hear from you, everybody. What are some characteristics of communicative language teaching? 
If you think of a classroom where communicative language teaching is the approach that the teacher is trying to implement, what are some things that you would expect to see or some types of activities um, or just some words that you would use to describe this approach to teaching, communicative language teaching? Let's see, grammar through practice from Farida, very nice. Let's see, gestures, great. So maybe some activities or acting things out. That was from Atisha, thank you. Um, creating genuine communication from Prene. Connected to student needs from Luis. Duha says maybe there are some activities like information gaps, that's great. And Muhammad says student involvement, um, it's interactive. Choi Rule says there are some games. Um, engaging in student-centered plan from Shazia. So excellent answers, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. And here are a few characteristics that I thought of, but because I had to write the slide before your comments, they're pretty much things you've said. But here are a couple I, I put down. We want our students to learn to communicate in English, to speak English, not speak about English. And learners are encouraged to experiment with language, to find a way to communicate their ideas, and not to worry too much about making mistakes. And learners interact with other speakers, both other learners and teachers. And learners are encouraged to speak a lot. Now this in turn has led to a lot of debate about the role of grammar instruction in language teaching, should we teach grammar rules formally or should we let students discover patterns on their own? How much time should we devote to focusing on correct form? Should we teach a grammar syllabus or should we have students work on projects and teach them grammar patterns only when they need help saying something? Learners want to be able to produce good sentences, sentences that sound right in English, how can we help them do this without falling back into the patterns of instruction that emphasize lots of grammar rules? I don't have the answers to all these questions, um, but I do have three principles that I think work well and can help us. So we'll look at each of these individually, but here are the three. One, Teach formal rules and meta language only as much as is needed by your students. Two, create opportunities for learners to use language structures in meaningful ways, communicating their own ideas on topics that are significant to them. And three, provide support, scaffolding, so that learners can achieve successful communication while getting enough practice with the target structures to make the structures their own. So let's look at that first principle. Teach formal rules and meta language only as much as is needed by your students. Meta language means the words we use to talk about language. For example, words like noun, verb, adjective, pronoun, present perfect tense, or adverbial clause. Many of us learned English in classes that taught us a lot of grammar rules, and maybe you enjoyed these classes and did very well in them. You may want to give your students the same kind of class. On the other hand, you may feel very insecure as a teacher because you haven't studied a lot of formal grammar rules and don't always know how to label things, but think you should. Sometimes we have textbooks or tests they encourage us to teach a lot of meta language and grammar rules. However, if we give a lot of grammar explanation and meta language, we may not be giving our students what they need. We shouldn't just assume that our job is to teach grammar rules. Instead, we should think carefully about what our group of students in our specific context truly needs. Sometimes there are good reasons to teach grammar very formally, sometimes not. The needs are not the same for all groups of students. So in your context, do you teach many formal grammar rules to your students? 
Why or why not? All right, great question. Let's hear from you, everybody. So in your class and in your schools, do you teach formal grammar rules to your students? And if so, why? And if not, why not? So what are some of the um, thoughts that you all have about teaching formal grammar rules to your students? We would love to hear from you. Let's see, Pranay says, yes, I do teach those rules. Yeah, let us know why, everybody. Um, Ronnie says they like to focus on corpus linguistics. Very nice. Um, but what about, what about teaching, um, teaching those formal grammar rules? Let's see, Osma says, I have a combination of rules and real life experiences. Very nice. Hen says, grammar is included in a context. In a context, Sadaf says, it depends on the student's needs. Very nice. Um, Atisha says, yes, it's necessary to understand the rules. Very nice. Muhammad says, some students ask for rules, so I do provide them. Um, and Alan, Alan says it's very common to teach grammar rules in his context. Um, so yeah, so it looks like a lot of diversity of response here, which is really great to hear. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for your great responses. What do you think, Nancy? Well, I, I appreciate that. And it, the it shows that what we need in different situations differs. Um, all contexts are not the same. Sometimes we don't need to teach grammar rules formally. Many times, but not always, students can learn to use grammar structures well without ever being told the rules. And one way to do that is we might use a song. Here's an example. A few years ago, my grandson came home from school singing a little song, and I thought, that's a great song for teaching English grammar. And teachers of young learners in several countries have agreed with me, so I'll share this song with you. This is how the song goes. My hand says hello, my hand says hello. Every time I see my friend, my hand says hello. My head says hello, my head says hello. Every time I see my friend, my head says hello. Excellent. You. Wow, that's beautiful. Very nice, thank you for sharing. I see a lot of people writing wow and very nice singing. <laughs> oh, you're kind, you're very kind. But here's a question. What grammar points are students practicing when they sing this line? My hand says hello. Great question. Let's hear from you, everyone. What grammar points are students practicing when they sing the line, my hand says hello? And again, we're hit, seeing lots of people sharing clapping emojis, saying <laughs> bravo, etc. <cetera. laughs> so I think we're, we all really enjoyed that song. What do you think, everyone? What grammar, grammar points are students practicing when they sing my hand says hello. Let's see. Okay, they're learning some vocabulary about the body, um, like using their body gestures. So they're saying hand and head, very nice. Good idea, Hina. Let's see, a lot of people are saying simple present. They're learning greetings from Edwin. Yeah, a lot of people saying that they're practicing the simple present, like Jose, Tagreed, Maria, and Alan. So thanks, everybody, for your great responses. Yes, and you're right. Uh, they are practicing present tense. They're practicing a possessive pronoun, my. They're practicing present tense, and that S on third-person singular verbs, which is a, often a problem. And this isn't exactly grammar, but they are getting the correct pronunciation of says, a word whose spelling often causes mispronunciation. And then as you pointed out, there's some vocabulary that's useful in there too. They don't know they're practicing all of this, but their brains become used to the patterns, and soon this kind of English just sounds right to them. Now here's what is actually a much harder question. What grammar are students practicing when they sing this line? Every time I see my friend. All right, what do you think everybody? What grammar points are students practicing when they sing, 
every time I see my friend? What grammar patterns or structures can you identify in here? So, okay, we have the action verb, like a uh, C, very nice from Hina. What other grammar points are students practicing with this line? Every time I see my friend. Habits or present simple from Alicia. Let's see, routines from Karima. Frequency, pronouns from Giselle. Adverbs of time from Hind. Habitual actions, adverbs of frequency from Pranay. Very nice, great answers everybody. What do you think, Nancy? Well, those are all accurate. And I've put on a few others that are more of the grammar structure pattern and different uh, books, different systems may use different labels, but the whole phrase is used as an adverbial to modify the main clause. There's a quantified noun every time. There's a noun complement clause, I see my friend. And there's a silent complementizer that every time that I see my friend. Now, if you look in grammar textbooks for noun complement clauses, they are found in the last chapters of the advanced books. It would be useless, silly, for us to try to explain all these grammar terms and analysis to our young students. They don't need these rules, and we probably don't either. We're teachers, not research linguists. But if we simply sing this song with our students through repetition, this complicated kind of English will begin to sound right to them. Singing a simple little song may not seem like grammar teaching. It might seem like an amusement or a small waste of time. However, the learners are absorbing important grammar patterns as they sing and are thereby learning grammar. And if I can just put in an additional note, it's useful to have a ritual to begin class, a signal that English class is beginning and we're going to start using this new language. You could use this song to begin your classes, a little ritual to let the children know that class time is beginning and they need to focus their attention on the group work. Now, I'm sure many of you have used songs in your classes for several different reasons. Can you suggest some songs that you have used with your students to help them learn English sentence patterns, as in grammar? Yeah, what do you think, everyone? Um, we'd love to hear from you. What are some songs that you've used to help students learn uh, grammar or English sentence patterns? Let's hear from you. And we know that the song that Nancy shared with us, maybe some of you think of that as more of a song for young learners, but there are a lot of great songs out there as well for higher level students or higher age students. So what songs have you used? Let's see, Hina says she used the song Roly Poly. I would love to hear that one. I don't think I've heard that one before. Lemon Tree song from Omar. Let's see, what else? What other songs have you used as part of your grammar instruction? Oh, I see another Lemon Tree. I'm gonna have to um, find this song and listen to it. Yesterday from the Beatles from Moises. Twinkle, twinkle, little star from Absal. Let's see, everything you breathe for present tense from Pranay. Bruno Mars song, count, me, count on me for first conditionals. That one is from Karen. So excellent. Thanks for sharing those great ideas, everybody. Yes, great. And if you want to add more songs to your classes, you might do an internet search, use the search term, songs for teaching grammar. Teachers have posted some of their favorites. And you might go to the American English site where you can find some folk songs like She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain, which is great for future time patterns, or Simple Down, which can help more advanced learners and teens see the relationships between tenses. And here's another side note. I have been with some teachers who live in cultures where adults do not approve of singing or listening to music. These same cultures had a great appreciation for poetry and for memorizing poems. If you don't want to use music, you might want to use lyrics of songs as texts 
and treat them simply as poetry. So to summarize principle one, do not teach grammar rules just because that's what you or your school have always done. Teach formal rules and meta language only when it's needed by your students. But no matter how, we have to demonstrate structures to our students and help them, help them learn these patterns. But we don't always have to use formal explanations and meta language. Older students usually need to know a little, at least a little meta language, for example, so that they can use dictionaries easily. Some learners, someone mentioned this earlier, are very analytical thinkers, they're scientists and they want rules. But many times scientists learners can become good users of a structure without ever having to describe or explain it. Sorry for tripping over my tongue there. Mm -hmm. Now, no matter how we decide to teach structures to our students, they need lots of practice so that they can become good users of English. And this brings us to principles two and three. Principle two, Create opportunities for learners to use language structures in meaningful ways, communicating their own ideas on topics that are significant to them. While there are many things that we do not know about how people learn languages, there's one thing we know for sure, and that is people cannot learn to speak English without speaking English. We need to create those opportunities for them. And the opportunities to speak need to include opportunities to communicate their own ideas, their own thinking, on topics that are in some way meaningful to them. This is one of the reasons that you as a teacher are so very important. Textbook writers try to choose topics that will interest students, but only you know your students and their specific interests. When learners work at communicating their own ideas, they may need some help some support, and that leads to teaching principle three. Provide support, scaffolding, so learners can achieve successful communication while getting enough practice with the target structure to make the structures their own. I've put a photo of some scaffolding around a building here in case that's a new word for you. The scaffolding helps the builders work until the structure is completely built. When we learn a new skill, there are usually things we can do, things we can't do, and things we can do with some help. Those in-between places, the things we can do with some help, are usually the places where we're learning, the places we are truly developing new skills. When learners begin using a new grammar structure, they usually need some help. After they've used the structure many times, they become able to use it without help. And this help is often called scaffolding. Scaffolding may be help that the teacher gives, such as rules, explanations, examples, and modeling, or it may be help from other learners. Learners working together can do more than each person can do alone. And learners don't have to be at exactly the same level to be helpful to each other. For the rest of this webinar, I'm going to show you some activities that have worked for me as I try to give students opportunities to communicate their own ideas on topics that are meaningful to them. So I'm going to start with a simple activity and this time use it for practicing verb tenses. Great. And we had some nice comments from our participants also. Just some nice um, people who are agreeing with you, Nancy, on how important scaffolding is. Ananan says scaffolding is a great technique. Karima says that it helps. Uh, Zenat says it's good when the teacher acts as a facilitator. And Mohammed says that scaffolding can do wonders in class. So just some, some nice comments I thought I'd share before we jump into these great activities. Wonderful, thank you. And as, when we finish each activity, we'll ask, does this activity provide scaffolding? Um, so this activity I'm going to show you right now is going to call it, what are they doing today? And we're going to use it to practice present progressive tense. And in some books that's called present continuous. So this is how you do it. Before class, 
Think of a living person that your students know about, an athlete your students admire, a singer from your country, a movie star, a political leader perhaps, and write three sentences about what that person might be doing right now. Then in class, divide your students into groups of two or three students and ask each group to write the names of famous people on small pieces of paper. These people must be alive, must be people everyone in the class is familiar with. Each group must create at least one slip of paper. It's one name on one slip, and they can make more than one piece of paper, but it's one name on one slip of paper. So collect the pieces of paper and then demonstrate the activity. And Kate and I will do that right now. Sounds so. Good. Mm -hmm. Kate, try to guess who I am describing. This is what I think she's doing right now. She is bathing her baby boy, Archie. She is talking to her husband, Harry. She is preparing to visit her mother-in-law, Elizabeth. Who is she? Oh, let me think. Well, it's a famous person and... I'm not sure about her baby's name, but I'm pretty sure about her husband's name and her mother-in-law's name. So I think it's Meghan Markle, am I right? Yes, it's Meghan, mm -hmm. Duchess of Sussex. So when you, then when you're doing this, you pass out the mystery name papers, one to each group, being careful that each group gets a slip they didn't write. And if you think your students need a little extra support, write your example sentences on the board while they're writing so they can see your model sentences. But each group must write three sentences in present progressive tense, telling what this person is doing right now. Taking turns, each group reads their three sentences aloud and the rest of the class tries to guess who the person is. Now, some of you may be thinking that your class is too large to use this activity. I think the largest class I've used it in had between 60 and 70 students present, maybe a few more, but our ch chair arrangement allowed us to divide into groups of three. So we had 20 to 25 groups to report and it worked for us. They were well-behaved students, so that mm -hmm. helps. Okay. Let's evaluate this activity. Are we applying our principles two and three? First, does this activity give students practice using a structure? Yes, they're writing, they're reading, and they're listening. Do students express their own ideas on topics that are um, meaningful to them? Well, yes. The students choose people they and their classmates know about. Textbook writers have to guess and can't include local celebrities. And does the activity provide support? Well, yes, you provide a model, oral and written, and students help each other write good sentences. This is an important kind of support or scaffolding. What are they doing today is a very simple activity but it usually gets students interested and involved because they choose their favorite people to talk about. My students usually laugh a lot and are interested in playing this game again on another day. Yeah, and Giselle is, uh, had a comment as well. She said, it, and it's fun. And Pranay said, and they're generating authentic structures. So great. Yes. Thanks for those comments. Well, when we have an activity that works, we want to use the um, structure, the, uh, the activity, uh, again, if we can. So uh, can you think of ways we could adapt this activity and use it for something other than present continuous? Yeah, what other ways can we adapt this activity to practice other structures? What do you think, everybody? How could you adapt this activity to use it to practice other structures, not just the present progressive or the present continuous? Let's see. Um, I, uh, somebody said we could use it to talk about the past. Maybe we can um, adapt the questions a little bit. Um, 
this one, Warda says this will help students to write their ideas in a structured way. Very nice. Um, we could ask what someone has done and, and use it to, uh, to practice the present perfect. Great idea. And maybe simple past for historic, for people who have passed and maybe we're learning a little bit about history. So wonderful, excellent ideas, everybody. Oh, I do appreciate those. I've put down some that are similar to yours, but you've added some good ones. I put down, you know, we could use a different verb tense. What did this person do yesterday? What will this person probably do next week or year? Um, perhaps you want to do it for habits and customs for simple present tense, because we use that for habits. What does this person usually wear or drive or talk about or do to relax? Or if you're teaching modals, you could have students practice some of the modals of possibility. What this person might be doing, could be doing, may be doing. But you had some other good ones to add to it. The point is you can adapt the activity and use it to teach something that you need to teach and or give your students practice with. Okay, here's a more complicated activity that I have used successfully. It is based on an activity which was developed by Marianne Christensen and Sharon Bassano, and they've given us all permission to use it and adapt it in any way we want. So thank you, Marianne and Sharon. One of the wonderful things about English teachers is that they share ideas. We created this variation in North Africa, but it's true all over the world. People are moving from their villages and their small towns to the big cities often the capital city of a country. And moving to the big city allows students to use English to express their ideas on this kind of a move while practicing writing complete grammatical sentences to express reasons. So here's how to do it. Divide your class into small groups. Four or five students per group is ideal, but your classroom may require a different arrangement. Tell each group that they need one piece of paper and one pencil for the whole group to use. And then draw a simple sketch of a happy family on the chalkboard. This is not a lovely sketch, but it doesn't have to be. We're English teachers, not artists. You might perhaps ask the students to give names to the family members. Now explain to them, this family is excited because they are going to move to the big city and you use the name of the big city in your country. And then why are they happy about moving? Tell the students that each group must create a list of good sentences telling why the family members are happy about moving to that big city. There'll be one list from each group. Give the class a set amount of time to work on their sentences maybe 10 minutes. You may want to walk around the room and give the groups help with their sentences if they ask. Okay, so let's try this ourselves. Take a minute and give us a few sentences about why this family is happy about moving to the big city. Great, what do you think everybody? What are some reasons why this family might be happy about moving to the big city? You can tell us some little sentences or some phrases. What do you think? This family's just decided to move to the big city. And what are some of the reasons why they might be excited or happy about this move? Let's see. Hend says, can I use guiding words in this activity? Think they have of course, if that's helpful to your students, go right ahead. Great. Let's see. Atisha says, because of hot, um, maybe because bet there are better facilities and good education in the big city. Hina says they are excited about the big city life. Miriam says they'll have better job opportunities. Let's see, Prene says they will be expanding their dreams. Um, Amuna, um, Amanula says they are going to have good work opportunities. A lot of people talking about their good work opportunities. Ilhama says that the children will be able to have new friends. Um, maybe they will have a beautiful flat, says Yurkin, or beautiful apartment. Wonderful, great answers, everyone. What do you think, Nancy? 
Okay, those are the reasons people do have, I think, for wanting to leave their little towns and villages. Uh, none of you mentioned shopping malls and cinemas, but I think that also is part of the reason. But what, what you do in your class is when the time is up, ask each group to read one of their reasons aloud to the class. Each group should try to give a reason that hasn't been mentioned already. And as groups read their sentences, you can provide any corrections you think are necessary and continue reading until all the reasons have been shared. And if your students like competition a lot, you could say that the team with the most reasons is the winning team. Now, make a few quick changes in the picture. Three years have gone by and our family is not so happy. Some things are good, but not everything. They often feel sad and they even think about moving back to their old village. They've begun to wonder if moving to the big city was a good idea. Ask each student group to write a new list, this time with reasons why this family are feeling a little sad and maybe a little unhappy. Can you think of some reasons? Share them with us. Yeah, what do you think everybody? Why, why might they be a little bit sad after they've been in the city for five years? Why might they be a little bit less happy? Let's see, Mohammed says the crowds. Maybe they're kind of tired of so many people. Um, too many crowds. Maybe there aren't very many jobs. Maybe they had, a, had more trouble than they thought finding a job. Pollution from Zenat. Things are very expensive in the city from Jenny. Very good, I, good thought there. They miss their village from Amanula. A lot of people saying that they miss something or they're they miss the country life from Alicia or their family. Um, Iknak says the traffic. And Prane says maybe they found that they didn't have time for each other anymore. So these are really great reasons, everybody. What do you think, Nancy? Oh, I think they're great. And one of the things I've noticed is that groups become very creative as they make and share their lists. They really think um, sometimes very important ideas. And also, they often laugh a lot. Now, it's always good to provide ways to give students an audience for their work, a way to publish it in some way. Reading sentences to the whole class gives an audience. You might also want to have students for homework prepare a neat list of their reasons and post them on the walls of your room. And someone last hour suggested this could be a way of generating ideas for a writing assignment, which I think is a great idea too. So notice some of the good features of this activity. The students speak and write. They get lots of practice with producing complete sentences expressing reasons. Uh, because we do the activity twice, once with the happy family and once with the unhappy family, Students get feedback and then have a second opportunity to produce sentences. Students stretch to say things they haven't said before in English. And we don't need much equipment. For this activity, it's helpful to have a chalkboard where you can draw the pictures, but if you don't, you can simply describe the family. If you as the English teacher move from room to room, you might want to draw the figures on a couple of large pieces of paper and carry them with you. Now, when we have a good format, it's always good to think about ways to use it again or use it with students with different interests. Can we adapt this activity so that we can use it with students, different groups? Um, when Mary and Christensen and Sharon Bassano created this activity, it was wedding bells. And I found that this works very well with adults and with students, perhaps university students, who are old enough to think about marriage. So in wedding bells, we sketch a couple who are getting married and feel very happy. Student groups create their list of reasons why this couple is happy and are looking forward to getting married. Then, oh dear, our couple has been married for seven years now. Things have gone wrong. They aren't so happy. For the second list, student groups come up with a list of reasons why this couple are having problems in their marriage. Now, can you suggest some other variations for this activity? The change doesn't have to be from happy to sad. It could be from worried and nervous to happy and content, for example. I have a couple of ideas, but maybe you have some more. 
Yeah, great. Let's have let's hear from you, everybody. What are some other ways that we could adjust this or adapt this activity for our classroom? And while we're waiting for your great ideas, um, just one quick question for you, Nancy, from Manu. Uh -huh. um, how could we use this activity with beginners? What do you think? Um, one of my activities, the next one I'm going to suggest is for children. Okay. Um, so that might answer that question. Great. Okay. Yeah, and I think also maybe we can, um, I think one person suggested um, some sentence starters or some guiding words that yes. might help beginners. Yes. Or maybe we put some related vocabulary on the board to help students remember a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. You certainly can put a sentence frame that says, they feel sad because. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, what are some, uh, some suggestions for another way to use this format, everyone? Let's see, Muhammad says using personal family pictures. That might be nice. You can have the students bring in family photos. Um, Eva said we could maybe have the students write advantages and disadvantages of every situation, which might help our students to develop their critical thinking skills, to think it's sort of about the pros and cons. Um, let's see. Wahid says we could talk about vacation, immigration. Um, Alan says we could talk about traveling. Um, Giovanni says maybe the students could role play how they felt at the beginning and at the end. That's a great idea. So really nice ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Yes, you are creative. You are professionals. It's wonderful. Here are a couple of my suggestions. They're small, but they might be useful to you. For younger learners, you might try children getting a pet. Now these children are very happy because their parents have told them they can get a new pet. And you could let the groups choose the kind of pet they want the children to get. You know, it's gonna be a cat, a small dog, a large dog, maybe a rooster. I've known some people have pet roosters. And then why do the children want this pet? And they can write some sentences about it. And if you're working with younger students, you may want to say to the group, write five sentences instead of saying you have 10 minutes to think of ideas. Just for a moment, can you give us a couple of simple sentences on why the children are happy to get a pet? Yeah, and we have a lot of people saying that they love these drawings. Very nice. <laughs> um, what are some, uh, yeah, why would the ch children be happy about getting a new pet? What do you think? Let's see, people are saying they would be happy for a new friend. Very nice. What other reasons why, the, why do you think the children would be happy about the, having a pet? They want a new friend from Hina. Um, maybe they're excited to play with their new pet. They now have their favorite pet from Nakib. Maybe it helps with their mental health from Atisha. They love to play with them. Excellent, wonderful ideas, everybody. Yes, and I, you know, it depends on the pet, but you can have things like the cat will catch mice or things like that. But now, well, the children look a little frustrated and sad. Can you give a few ideas of why these children are not completely happy with their pet? <laughs> why do you it think, maybe, <laughs> why are they maybe less enthusiastic about the pet or less happy? What do you think, everybody? Let's see, because they have a responsibility from Lazarus. <laughs> right. It needs yes. a lot of taking care of from Alicia. Right. Um, very nice. And they're also, you know, the cat bites or the dog chews their shoes, or, you know, the things that pets do. Um, now, I don't know how it works in your country, but in the U.S., children often change schools when they're 11 or 12 years old. They must move from elementary school to middle school. And a few years later, they move from middle school to high school. Some students are excited about making this change, but some students are a bit more nervous. Right now, my granddaughter is just a little nervous about moving from middle school to high school next year. So um, here are these children. They look a bit worried about going to a new school next year. Why are they worried? And I, I'm just a little concerned about time, so I don't think we'll uh, take time for you to give your ideas. 
but you can, I mean, students of that age can think of some reasons. Maybe the teachers will be mean. Maybe I won't have friends. But here are the same students. They've been in the new school for six months. They look happier. Why? Well, they have friends. The teachers are nice. They're learning lots. We, we can help children think ahead to the, some of the things won't be as hard as they might think they would be. So let's evaluate. Does this whole activity give our students opportunities to express their own ideas on a topic? Does it, yes. Is the topic significant to them? Well, if you as a teacher choose an appropriate topic, yes. And does this activity provide support or scaffolding so that learners can achieve successful communication while practicing with the target structures? Yes. The group members help each other complete the task. Students help each other produce more than any individual could produce on their own because group members add ideas, they add vocabulary, and they add grammar help. Again, this is an activity format that you can adapt to your own context. You know your students. And also, because it requires so little equipment or preparation, this is an activity format that you might want to keep handy to use on the day that you need an emergency lesson plan. Maybe the electricity stopped working and you can't use your PowerPoint or computers, or maybe you have to substitute for a teacher in another class but can't use the plan the other teacher was going to use. It's always good to have an emergency lesson plan in the back of your teaching notebook. Now, let's look at one more communicative activity that allows students to express their own ideas and at the same time get a lot of practice using a grammar structure. Call it My Shield. And we can use this activity to practice specific verb tense or usage, to also to develop conversational fluency, and to practice a particular category of vocabulary like food or sports or something. So before class, Decide on a grammar structure or structures you want to give your students more practice using. Then create a simple model to show the pattern. And think of four questions that can be answered using the structure. So for example, if I want my students to practice simple vocabulary and the verb forms is and are, I could create this model. My favorite blank is are blank. My favorite day is Sunday. My favorite shoes are tennis shoes. And I could write four questions. What is your favorite color? What are your favorite desserts? What is your favorite television show? Who are your favorite singers? With more advanced students, I might want my students to practice by plus a gerund, an ing form, to express how something is done. Someone did something by. I locked the door by using this key. And I could write these four questions. How did you help someone this week? How did someone help you this week? How did you relax last weekend? How did you start your day today? And if you want just conversation practice or more advanced students, you can just give them some good questions and ask them to choose the structure they think is best without the model. That's for more advanced students. In class, Ask your students to draw a four section shape on a piece of paper. I usually have them draw a shield like this because a shield has often been used to represent a special person. You could have them draw a box or a window with four sections instead. Write the model sentence structure on the chalkboard and discuss it. Answer any questions students have. And then tell the students that when you ask a question, they should not copy down the question or write the answer. Instead, they should draw a small symbol that represents their answer. Ask your four questions slowly, giving students time to draw a symbol. So, how did you help a friend this week? Well, I helped a sad friend by giving her some flowers, so I'll draw a flower. How did someone help you this week? A friend helped me by giving me a ride, so I'll draw a car. How did you relax last weekend? I relaxed by reading a book. How did you start your day today? 
I started my day by drinking a big cup of coffee. When students have completed their shields, have the students work in pairs. Each student uses the grammar structure to explain why they chose the symbols that they drew. When students have finished, have students work with a new partner and explain their shields again for more practice and increased fluency. So let's evaluate. Does this activity give students practice using the structure? Yes, speaking practice. And by changing partners and explaining their symbols a second time, students get more practice. Research shows that when we try to answer a question twice, we become more efficient. We do a better job. Is the topic meaningful to them? If I choose good questions, the activity gives students a chance to express their own ideas and personality to their classmates. This activity can increase the friendships between class members. And does this activity provide support, scaffolding? Well, yes. You as a teacher provide a model, oral and written, and students help each other remember the questions and give the answers. Why draw symbols? I suggest you have students draw a little symbol for three reasons. It encourages students to remember the questions in English. It encourages more talking. Students have to ask each other what the symbol is and what it means. In communicative language teaching, we want lots of talking. And a third reason is that it gives some of your more artistic students a chance to shine. Some people are better at drawing than they are at English, and we want them to have successful experiences too. So our time is getting short, but I have one last activity, my dream house. This simple activity is a good one for practicing the grammar of nouns, singular, plural, countable, not countable, and for using adjectives with nouns. A floor plan is a sketch of how a house would look if you took the roof off and looked down from above. In class, show students a sample floor plan and explain what it is. Create a list of useful vocabulary for describing one. Then for homework, tell students to draw a floor plan of their dream house. The house is not one that they really live in. And because it's a dream house, it can have lots of things no ordinary house would have. This will probably be a popular homework assignment. My plan here includes a swimming pool, a shower room next to the pool, and a large TV and video game room. I think I've got a couple of grandsons who would like that, but we certainly have never lived in a house with a private swimming pool and a video game room. In class, have students work in pairs describing to their partner the floor plan. How many rooms are there? What are the rooms? What are the main furnishings in each room? change partners. Students describe the plan again to their new partner. Then we can add other activities. For a writing assignment, have each student write a description of their dream house. Post the floor plans and the written descriptions if you decide to assign them on the wall so that students can see the work. If your class is small, you can have half of your students go stand by their drawings and then have the other half of the students walk around and ask questions about the floor plans. Then trade roles. The students who are walking around go stand by their floor plans and the ones who are standing walk around and ask questions. If your class is really large and you don't have much walking room, you could simply leave drawings on the wall and let students look at them before or after class if they're interested. So let's evaluate. Does this activity give students practice using a structure? Yes, speaking practice. By changing partners, students get more practice and research shows that when we try to answer a question twice, we become more efficient, we do a better job. Is the topic meaningful to them? Usually, we all like to dream a little. And does the activity provide support? Not so much. You can, however, give support if you generate a list of useful vocabulary and write some model sentences or sentence stems for students to see and use. Now, I think, Kate, we're very, very close to the end of time. Is that right? Yeah, I think so, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so as we conclude, I have a final reminder. 
Who are the true experts in teaching in your context? You are. I hope you'll take the activity ideas and teaching principles that we've discussed today and adopt them or adapt them to meet the needs of your special group of students in your teaching context. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Nancy. We have a lot of great um, comments that came in from our participants. Um, Ilhama says, thank you for sharing this and supporting us. Selma says, really great session. I'm so happy today after attending this lecture. Kamar says, nice session, full of fun. Um, wonderful, and uh, let's see, Alicia says, thank you both for this session, and so does Atisha. And a really nice comment from Ruben Innocent Ruben in Rwanda, who says, I love the USA for helping us in my teaching career. All of these could have cost me, but I'm happy to have them and be able to use them for my context. So thank you so much for sharing those great ideas, and thanks again, Nancy, for this excellent presentation.